Happy Sabbath, church. Please stand and join me in singing Holy Ground. We're standing on Holy Ground. Father, on this special day that you have given us, dear Lord, we worship you in spirit and truth, that you may accept our words, our thoughts, our deeds today, to glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. We are standing on hope. It was introduced to us uh, last week's Sabbath. Um, it was ent it's entitled Sitting at the Feet of Jesus. Um, the story goes of two sisters. They were both doing, good, doing a good work. But one, God said, was doing what she was supposed to do. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Join us in singing. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, hymn number 618. Sitting at the feet of Jesus, oh, what words I hear him say. Happy place so near, so precious. Jesus, there I love to weep and 
Lord's brain. What a life from His fullness gather, grace and comfort every day. Bless me, O oh my Savior, bless me, as I'm waiting at Thy feet. Oh, look down in love upon me, let me see Thy face so sweet. Give me, Lord, the mind of Jesus, make me holy as He is. May I prove one thing with Jesus, who is all my righteousness. Amen. You may be seated. As I look out in the congregation, I see many new faces. I'm not going to ask you to stand, but I'm going to ask our members to stand also, to, to stand, and that we may welcome each other here in this Sabbath day. custom um, we're going to announce the birthdays that were this week and the anniversaries um, August the 8th Eileen Rodriguez had her birthday on the 10th Unai Simmons had a birthday on the 11th also Sine Ray Morris had a birthday 
and our very own in Dominican Republic, Dave Pierman had a birthday. Isabel Bella Stowe had a birthday on the 12th, and Cara Reed had a birthday on the 12th. Um, the anniversaries, Anthony and Anita Peets celebrated 38 years of marriage. And um, also on the 11th of August, Robert and Robert Packwood celebrated 13, 33 years of marriage. So um, let's have a birthday song and then a prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to especially acknowledge the birthdays this week and the anniversaries, dear Lord. Truly, every day is a blessing, but the birthdays are a special blessing because it announces a whole new year to start again, dear Lord. We thank you for the breath and life that you have given us. Like I said, bless especially everyone that was represented for this week and the anniversaries. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a, um, a slight um, announcement right now. Putting Norma Lynn on the spot so people need to see her. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Norma, Norma Lynn, you want to come up, please? No? Okay. I'm thankful she's here. Okay, what we're doing, family, I want to say good morning again. And this is coming from the Community Service Department. I am our leader, and we have a lot of team members here. Some of us are not here, but um, I would just like everybody to stand. Those that are my team members, can you please stand? We have um, Natalie, Dawn, Norma Lynn, who's over our feeding program. Um, let's see. I did see Brenda, but I, didn't, I don't see her here. Brenda Burchill. Um, Agnes and Delia. Nope, not here. Okay. So what pretty much I'm doing today is I'm reaching out. We have been very active in the community. And what we do is we provide food and other assistance to the needy families for a number of years. First, we do, the, we do a food pantry on the four, fourth Sunday of every month, and we do a feeding program every Tuesday. Matthew 25, 35 says, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. So today, we're really asking for your help. That you may ask, how can you help? I'm glad you asked. What I'm asking you to do, church, this is our first time doing it. Um, we're asking for you to commit a three-time donation of $25 or a one-time donation of a $75 gift. The goal is to reach $2,250 before the end of the year, so that's December 31st. Now, you may ask, well, how do I do that? 
Well, you see this here, tithe envelope. You want to write on here when you pay your tithe, your offering, you want to write in community service and um, give your donations that way. Or, like I do, you want to pay online. And when you pay online, you have to set that up. Then you're going to ask the, um, well, not ask, but you're going to communicate with our treasurer or the designee, you know, where you want the money to go, okay? Now, don't forget to ask the treasurer or her designate. That's very important. If you don't do that, the money doesn't go, it doesn't go where it's supposed to go. If we each do a little, we can do a lot. In addition, we will have a food basket. So I'm asking for more. We're going to have a food basket out in the front of the church where hopefully you'll be able to donate. This is next week. Donate foods, non-perishable foods. Now at this point I do have um, some flyers that, not flyers, they're like a grocery list. So you can have some guidelines on what types of foods we want you to bring. So they will be handed out. Um, I was hoping they could hand them out to you now, but you know you can get them as you're leaving the church. Okay. So remember, next week we'll have a food basket or a box that will be at the front of church and you can place your foods in it. Some people are asking me, what kind of foods are we talking about? Non-perishable, things that don't go bad. Um, and that would be canned goods, bottled goods, okay? So our community service team would like to thank you in advance for your help of fulfilling Jesus' mission for humanity. Blessings. And you'll see our flyer on the bulletin board out there. Looks something like that. Okay, thank you. Right, right now we're going to have the uh, children's story by Michelle Desi. Oh, not Desi, oh, is it?
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, looks like all the little people are here, so I'm going to swap seats so I can see them. All right. Morning. Oh, that was weak. I know you had breakfast. I know you two had breakfast at least. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Good. Wow, you don't sound good at all. Okay, we'll keep this show rolling. How many of you know what the word grateful means? Hands up. Grateful means to be gracious. To be gracious. Who else? To be kind. To be kind. Yeah, that's good too. Wait. To be thankful. Yeah, a little prodding from mom. To be thankful. Grateful means to be thankful. You want to say thankful? Good. And to be good. Yes, that's also helpful. Now, who watched the news this week? I try not to watch it because it's never got nice stuff on it, but who happened to watch the news this week? Anybody? What did, did you hear about what's happening in Maui? They have a lot of big fires. Now, we're going to have a little science, uh, a little science information at the beginning. I'm the kid of a fireman or firefighter. So fire is they're having big fires in Maui. And what do you need to have a fire? You need fuel, oxygen, and a source of ignition. And Maui had a drought. That's the fuel. Now they're having a hurricane out in their, their area. So that's oxygen. And somebody probably helped it start. I don't know how it started. But so they have these big fires. And they, in certain areas of Maui, probably a majority of it, have lost everything. It's all burned to the ground, like gray ash. It's horrible. And I was reminded this week that we should be grateful for everything we have. Because you know what? We tell you guys to be grateful for stuff when you're growing up, but you know that the adults have the same problem. We forget to be grateful. So that's our story this morning. So we're going to listen. Hold on. No, Molly, you don't need to hold it. Thank you. All right, I have an assistant who wants to take over. All right, so our, uh, the verse we're going to listen to is Colossians 3.15, and it says, And let the people, the peace of God, rule in your heart, to which you are called in one body, and to be ye thankful. So to always be grateful and thankful. So our story, let's see. It's called Surrounded by Gifts. No one listening to Sarah complain would have guessed that every day she was the recipient of more gifts than she could count. When she opened her eyes in the morning, there was a pile of gifts sitting on her bed. All day long, in fact, she received one gift after another. Yet, strangely enough, Sarah was one of the... Sarah took most of those gifts for granted. Only time she really thought about those gifts was when one didn't arrive or when somebody got one that she thought was better than what she had. On one particular afternoon, Sarah was feeling particularly blue. She, a gift she'd been longing to have for a long time, still hadn't arrived. And she was surrounded by all the other gifts that had arrived, yet Sarah was not enjoying them. Instead, she was bemoaning the absence of this one gift she really longed for. Have you ever had something you really wanted and it just didn't seem to show up? And does it make everything else kind of feel like, meh, yeah, not as cool? I, I get that feeling too. Trust me, every grown-up sitting in the church has that feeling, has understood that feeling too. Sarah had a good reason to want the gifts too. She couldn't serve the king the giver of all of these gifts, she could serve the king much better if she had that gift. Wasn't it, go- it was- wasn't it a good gift she longed for? Indeed it was. Yet why then had it not come? Why so downcast, Sarah? A question from Sarah's sister Mary. The gift I was wanting still isn't here, said Sarah as she pouted. Mary paused before replying. Sarah, do you trust the king? Now remember, the king's the guy who gives her all these gifts. Sarah kind of thought about this question. 
Of course she trusted the king. The king is who had rescued her from her prison. She vowed to serve him with everything within her. Well, of course, she said. And did he, you not tell him your life belonged to him? Sarah nodded. So Mary continued. Then you've no cause to complain about your gifts. Sarah knew her sister was right. And what a fool she had been. What did it matter that the gift hadn't arrived anyway? It, if she needed this gift to complete her task, then he would send it. And if not, we must, he must have something else planned for her. Either the way, though, she'd been missing out on the joy of serving her king and giving thanks for all that she had already been given. Sarah gave her sister a hug and then scampered out of her room with a light in her heart again and was surrounded by the gifts, and it was time to start living like it, she thought. So that's a story. So it's kind of a metaphor, and that's a big word that says it's a story that represents something else. The king is Jesus. Jesus gives us everything we have, and he gives it when we need it, even if we think we need it at another time. So we're going to be grateful every day for the things we have and to trust in who? God. That's right. We're going to trust in God that he gives us the gifts we need when we need them. Who would like to have prayer for us? Okay, come up. You can have two. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your holy day. And thank you for the people around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can be here together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. You can go back to your seats. Come get your bulletin. Can you do anything today to prevent future bone fractures? Women were surveyed in 1976 and again 25 years later in 2001. When asked about wrist fractures and physical activity, interesting results surfaced. The women who were the most physically active in 1976 were almost 40% less likely to have a wrist fracture by 2001. Physical activity had a protective effect. Building strong bones is another ageless advantage. Happy Sabbath. How many of you have ever been to any type of training, class, workshop, seminar? Yeah, okay. So years ago, um, I worked for the uh, training department in a large firm and most of the time we were preparing handouts for training workshops and seminars, um, whether we were giving it or we had a guest presenter. And the handouts were for the attendees to take notes. Um, sometimes it showed what was going to be covered in the, in the workshop um, so that everybody can kind of stay on board. So we have handouts for people to take notes and follow along with the presenter. And as I was preparing for this right now, um, I had this thought that this portion, part of the service actually has a handout. Yeah, this is a handout. But in, rather than taking notes on it, we want you to put notes in it, okay? So um, if you need one of the handouts, you can raise your hand and the deacons can give you one. In the meantime, I just want to talk about the principles of, um, of giving, which are pretty straightforward. So, and your handout explains it all. So we are required to return the tithe to the Lord, and the tithe is 10% of our income. Remember, God can do more with 85% than you can do with 100%. And I say 85% because we are also encouraged to give systematic offering um, along with our tithe to help the church. 
Our offerings pay for things like church bills and Sabbath school expenses, um, BI subsidy, departmental expenses. And also we want to thank you for giving to the church improvement fund. We are now in the black, thanks to your sacrifice. However, the church has a list of needs that require additional sacrifice for many of us. And those, um, that information is in your bulletin, whether you have it online, um, in your hand, or on the bulletin board. Today's loose offering, now that's the money that is given in the offering plate that's not in a tithe envelope. That goes to the loose offering, and today it's for Christian Record Services. What's Christian Record Services? Christian Record Services offers many services and programs, including Bible study lessons, books, magazines, Bibles on audio, Braille, and in large print. Now, I like to listen to uh, Dr. Percy Harold read the Sabbath School lesson, and I understand that that started by an organization like Christian Record Services so that the blind can follow along with the um, lesson. Christian Record Services services nearly 18,000 members worldwide through Phone Faith, scholarships for higher education, and a national camp for blind children. These services and programs are free of charge to people who are legally blind. Remember, there are three ways to give during the offering time here, by dropping off your tithe envelope as a conference office, and you can return your tithes and offerings online. Can the deacons please come to receive our tithes and offerings? Let's have a prayer. Father God, it is an awesome responsibility and honor to serve you in this way. We thank you for the gifts that you have given us, and we pray that the gifts that we return and give back to your work will go and do a mighty work in all parts of the world. We thank you for your blessings, and we pray that you will continue to bless those who give and those who are not able to give. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning and happy Sabbath to each and every one. It's good to see your contented faces this morning. I don't see too many smiles, but I sure see contentment. Praise God. Our scripture this morning is taken from the book of Isaiah. Chapter 45, verse 22. It reads, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. May the, God, may the Lord add a rich blessing to the hearers and the reading of his word. Remember the uh, lyrics of this song. It's an old song, and uh, you probably would remember. It says, this is just one verse. There's a garden where Jesus is waiting, and he bids you to come meet him there, just to bow and receive a new blessing in the beautiful garden of prayer. It is prayer time. I pray, Father, that all here are ready to reach out to you. And right now, I just ask if there be a show of hands for any uh, prayer requests any, that, that you may have. Thank you. As we take our positions, some uh, will kneel, and if you can, let us prepare for prayer. Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you on this, your holy Sabbath day, praising your holy name and thanking you for the love and the grace and the mercy that you have extended to us. Thank you, Father, for bringing us through another week. We all had different experiences through the week, Lord, and you have blessed us in many different ways. Thank you, Father, for this day of rest, the day when we can put aside our worldly activities, our worldly thoughts, and commune with you and fellowship with each other. Father, this is also a time when we should reflect on our own um, lives. How we may have handled situations this week. And Father, if we have found wanting, we want to come asking forgiveness for any sin we may have committed in thought, word, or deed. Father, we yet still have struggles of many different kinds. And Father, there is strife, 
even in our families. Someone's father may not be pulling their weight. Someone may be shocking their responsibilities. Someone may be caught up in bad habits or dividing the family. So, Father, we pray that you would strengthen the families. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who may be causing disruption and that you would touch their hearts. The family father is the foundation of the, of, of, of the community and we need strong families. Father, there are people who uh, have challenges with uh, sickness we ask, Father, for that you would touch them and you would be of them, you'd be of their families, you'd be of those who may be treating them for, for, for that sickness. Dear Lord, there are some who have to choose whether they're going to eat or buy medicine. We ask, Father, that you would provide for them that you would make a situation where someone will go by and, and help or, Lord, you have many ways to uh, solve our problems. The situation may seem hopeless, Lord, but, Lord, you can make a way out of no way. All power is in your hands, all wisdom, all knowledge, there's nothing difficult for you, dear Lord. But Lord, many hands are raised this morning. And you know our hearts. You know every thought. You know that many of us are carrying burdens. Some have carried burdens for their whole lives, Lord, and don't know how to put them down. You see our troubles, dear Lord. You see our infirmities. You see our struggles. But because of the love you have for us, dear Lord, you are touched by our infirmities. You are touched by the pain that we suffer and the distress that we suffer. And in response, you said, you invite us, you invite us all to come unto you, all who are heavy laden. And you will, not maybe, you will give us rest. So Father, let us put our trust in you. Let us believe in you. And Father, if we have trouble believing, then we pray for that you would help us to believe. Father, we come this morning. We um, ask your blessings on um, those who are here with us today. We ask your blessings on those who have joined us on um, YouTube or, or however virtually they may have, enjoy, have joined us. And we ask the rich blessings on them and, and, and each family. Dear Lord, there are many issues that are pressing on us and there are many issues that are distressing us and many issues that are concerning us at this time. There is much strife in the world, Father. There is much suffering. There are the fires in, in, in Maui and there are earthquakes and there are floods. And then, Father, there is man-to-man -man crime and there are wars that all causing suffering and pain. But Father, we are so thankful that you know these things are going to happen. You, your word told us this thing is going to happen. And you have prepared a way, Father, that we can rise above all of these distresses. 
and that is by your word, that is by surrendering to you. So, but Father, we just ask that you would be with many who are suffering, that you would bring relief to them. But we pray, Father, that the minds will return to you, that we may seek refuge, that we may not be distressed by the things that are taking place on this earth. For one day, Father, you're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth which you will make and there will be no more suffering, no more pain. Just love and joy with you. Heavenly Father, there are other distresses on, on this earth. We, Father, we, we, we find, Father, that many leaders are being pressured and we pray for our leaders today. We pray for our leaders in the church. We pray for our leaders generally in, in countries. There are some dis difficult situations and there are some difficult subjects and topics that need to be addressed, Father. And it's going to take courage and it's going to take wisdom. And we pray, Father, that you would grant this to our leaders as they have to deal with these issues. Dear Lord, some leaders of countries have been pressured into making decisions that are contrary to their own beliefs. Father, you see it all. And you see all the movement, and we pray, Father, that you would awaken your people. That we will understand the things that are going, going on. We pray, Father, that you would help us to prepare ourselves and get others ready also. Dear Lord, I want to lift up our speaker this morning. Pray, Father, that you will give power to his word, that his word will penetrate even the most stubborn mind. We pray, Father, that he would, you would bless him, and you would clear his mind, you would make his speech clear. And you would bless the hearer. And Father, if the words penetrate, if the, if the hearer is moved by these words, we pray, Father, that they would not resist. We pray, Father, that you would move Satan out of the way, that they would yield to the words, that they would surrender and not fight. We just want to thank you, Father, once again. Thank you for the, your, uh, the opportunity to come and fellowship. And we pray that the word will be sweet to our ears this morning. We pray that your love will touch each heart today. And we pray that the hope in your faithful promises will bring peace to every soul. Father, let us remember that our strength lies in you and that you are there waiting to help us. I ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
video. Again. I don't know why that keeps popping up. Okay. Let's go. And Thanks. Hey everyone, our world is changing rapidly. Coming Out Ministries is dedicated to provide not only resources, but compassion and love to help a world that is lost in confusion about biblical identity and sexuality. That's why we're partnering with the Village SCA Church in Berrien Springs, Michigan, to provide three consecutive and simultaneous programs that are designed to bring holistic truth about identity and sexuality. From September 16th until the 24th, we're gonna be providing a spiritual emphasis in the church in the evenings, but during the day on the 18th and 19th of September, there's gonna be leadership training for pastors and elders. We're gonna have powerful speakers like Eric Walsh, Yvonne Restrepo, Neil Nedley, Jay Gallimore, and many others. You don't wanna miss this. Not only will we have leadership um, talking about identity and sexuality in a holistic way, but we're also gonna provide testimonies of people that have come out, not only of LGBT issues, but also abortion recovery, pornography addiction. So you don't wanna miss this. Now, Coming Out Ministries is going to have our third annual Coming Together Live event from September 20th until the 24th. Again, providing not only um, testimonies of people that have come out of Oh, well. pardon me. I'm sorry. I'm still trying to learn how to use this new equipment. Happy Sabbath. As you can see, we are announcing and we are promoting a, a edifying, edifying teaching seminar on human sexuality. Can you say amen to that? Praise God. And it will be free. It will be online. And once I get a hold of operating this new system, I'm sure I will stop making mistakes. Also, we want to thank God for the graduation of Rhonda Lynn Tacklin, uh, Bermuda's newest nurse. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? I know that the Tacklins are very proud, and so are we. And now we can't wait for Mama to get also her nursing degree. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. No. Okay, we today we have uh, the continuation of our days of Noah. How many of you were blessed last week? Let me see your hands. Praise God. We about had about 50 or 60 people last Sabbath just here for this seminar. Now, please re re notice it starts at 545, 545 each night. And we want to thank God for our elder, Ronnie Tacklin, who had the message last Sabbath and God's uh, divine, the divine sandwich. Can you say amen to that? I just received the notification from the conference. We are sad to inform that the Allegheny East Conference, former president, uh, Dr. Kibble, uh, Pastor Kibble has passed. Our condolences to the families and all those, uh, and all those uh, who have been affected by, by this sad passing. We Today we are going to bid also, uh, we're going to have a special moment of prayer for two of our friends, Tori and Lucy Darrell. Would you guys please come up? Tori and Lucy Darrell are going to be leaving the island of Bermuda, and we want to have prayer for them 
before they depart. I'm going to ask our elders to please come up to the platform. Any of you who have been ordained, please come up to the platform. Uh, where's that microphone? Okay, here it is. So, we not only pray for children, we pray for adults. Can you say amen to that? Amen, amen. We, I know, I wish I got to know you more, Daryl, but I praise God for having gotten to know you as much as I have. I don't know if you want to share with the community. Go right ahead, please. Uh, good morning, church. Good morning. Um, this is my wife, Lisa Darrow, and she has been struggling with uh, medical difficulties, and we just have found that we just cannot afford it here. And so we've been struggling with this issue for the last several years, and uh, it's just come to a place where we, we just can no longer get the treatment that she needs to get. And so we're having to, we're having to relocate to Brazil in order for her to be able to get this, this treatment. And we're, with God's blessing and God's will, we pray that she will beat this. And so we, God has brought this about very quickly. We only found out this was going to happen within the last uh, month. Um, I have been unemployed since March, and God has brought people together to pay for our tickets, to pay for pretty much everything we need to get there. Um, and so he's, he's, he's brought this about very quickly, and we were very shocked. I even found out that I was going two days ago. <laughs> so God has brought this out about very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, we're asking for your prayers. It's a very difficult move. We don't know what, we don't know anything. We're literally going in faith because God has struck, instructed that that's where we go. And so that's where we're going. We're going to make a circle around you, if that's all right. Elder Julie, would you like to also have a prayer? Yeah. Okay. I'll have one in, in you. Please close. Okay. okay. Father God, thank you for the ministry of Brother Daryl and his wife. And Father, we know, we know, Father, that you have unexpected blessings coming. Yes. Father, we know that your word does not return to you void. Yes. And Father, we know, Father, that you will make all things work together for good. So Father, we are praying for healing for our sister, Daryl. Father, please touch her body. Restore her health. We thank you, Father, for the health that she has. And Father, we are claiming that as a down payment on the total health you will give to her. And Father, thank you for the witness of a husband who does not abandon his wife in her time of need. Thank you, God, for a husband who stands by his wife in her time of need, for a husband who fulfills his vows for better or worse in sickness and in health. Now, Father God, even as you, Father, will bless Sister Daryl, so too, Brother Daryl. And we pray, Father, that you will make him as a tree planted, planted, planted by the waters. And he shall bear fruit in his season. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Father in heaven, Lord, as we pause a moment longer, Father, we want to pray for this uh, beautiful couple, uh, friends and almost like family, that we have enjoyed their, their presence and their ministry and their witness in Bermuda. Lord, we thank you for Sister Lou. Lord, we're asking that you said that you would come unto me and you'd go and pray unto me and, and that I will hearken unto you. And so we thank you that you are the God who sees and you are the God who hears. 
And so we bring our collective prayers, even as I pray out loud, uh, that our membership will be, will be praying on her behalf. Lord, you know exactly what it is that she needs, and so we're asking. You said ask, and so we're asking that you would touch her body, that you would go before her. You have opened the way, and so, Lord, you do not disappoint. And so we want to praise you and thank you in advance what you will do for them, that you've opened the path for them to get there, and so we know that you have prepared a place uh, for them. Lord, I ask that you would be with with her husband in a special way, that you continue to uh, be with him as he uh, cares and, and nurtures his wife. Mm-hmm. We, we recognize in, in illness that it is it's always challenging uh, for, for both family members and everybody's impacted. And so we ask that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit to encourage his heart and to strengthen his heart. And Lord, you are the God who dries tears, and so I pray that you would be with uh, Lou today, that you dry her tears, and that turn her, her sorrows and into, into joy and rejoicing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Precious promises. We have to hold fast to his promises. I'm good. That's it. Um, two texts come to my mind. Um, when I say texts, most times I think about chapters. <laughs> um, Psalms 121, as well as Psalms 91. These are promised chapters. Um, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills. Amen. Um, and then also the other one is, I'm going to go back to my phone. I know it by heart, but he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Two power, power chapters. And even for you, Sister Daryl, you, Brother Daryl, you guys can hold fast to these promises. Um, We're going to be singing three songs. Lord, I lift your name on high. And we'll transition to you are my hiding place. And you are my hiding place. We're going to split. We're going to sing through the whole song. And then we're going to split where this side will sing. And this side will follow. So it's like an echo. Yes? And then we will finish with the longer I serve him. All right. Thank you.
Amen, amen. Could we give a, the Lord a hand clap of praise for the worship that we just had experienced? Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Is that all right? We're not praising individuals. We just want to praise God. And the Bible's, Bible allows for giving praise to God with the clapping of the hands. If you don't know that, now you do. Morning, God bless you, happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Warwick Church where we worship God. And I want to thank all of our visitors for being here with us today. Thank you so much. If you have the opportunity, if you haven't done so already, please fill out one of our well, uh, visit, visitation cards. I want to thank the deaconesses. I saw them duly performing that duty. Thank you so much, deaconesses, for your help. Our message for this Sabbath is come, our message for this Sabbath, for these, at least every time that I'm going to be standing up here to speak, will be come out of her, my people. We are going to look at the seven messages to the churches found in Revelation. We are also going to look at the same time to the seven seals. And then to add it one last bit of material, we're also going to do the trumpets. How does that sound to you? Therefore, if you would like to have a study outline, just send me a WhatsApp or send me an email, and I'll be happy to send you the material so that way you can go over it on your, on your own. There is quite a bit of information, and I am trying to heed the counsel of some of my mentors and where they say, Hector, you have a lot of material, but you don't have enough time for it. So I'm going to try to heed their counsel. Our message for this morning is the Church of Ephesus. If you would please rise, if you would please rise, and as you're rising, just look at the person to your left, to your right, just tell them welcome. Just, just say hello to them, shake their hand, just let them know that you recognize them, you acknowledge them, you see them, and you value them. Just, just let them know that. It's, we're not going to do a whole lot of thing. We're just going to welcome one. Just say hello to the person right next to you. We have our Bibles in hand. If you don't, you can please raise your hand. Somebody will be happy to bring you over a Bible. We're going to be using our Bibles for a bit, okay? I hope that's all right. As a matter of fact, I, I will need seven volunteers. I will need seven volunteers. So I hope that I have seven people who are willing to read some passages of Scripture. Let's read our Bibles, turning therein to 1 John chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 16 through 21, 16 through 21. Please keep me in prayer. I'm having, my hearing is becoming worse and worse. So if, uh, if you hear me starting to yell a little bit, just know it, it appears that I hit that age when things start shutting off, okay? So uh, just keep me in prayer, please. First John chapter 4, verses 16 through 21. And those of you watching online, please, you're going to need your Bible, bro. So you might as well get it. We're going to read antiphonally. I'll read the first verse. You read the second, and we'll continue thereon. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Verse 17. Herein is the love made perfect, that we may be boldness in the day of judgment, because he is his, so are we. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Verse 21. And this commandment hath we from him, that he loveth God, love his brother also. I find it interesting that 
the admonition, the counsel, the rebuke that the church of Ephesus has is one simple one. You have lost your first love. That's it. That is the only rebuke that they have. We're going to be looking, as I said, at all three of these messages. The seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets. Because these messages are not for the world. They're for us. God is not talking to them. God is talking to us. And while it is real easy to point to other people and tell them what they're doing wrong, and while it's real easy to correct other people, let's see how we fare when God corrects us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, please anoint these lips, mind, and heart, that the words that I say may be acceptable unto thee. Lord, you've been, you know, well, you know, Father, you know. So, Father, let your words be spoken today, not mine, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You want to be seated in the presence of God, and you're going to want to open up your Bibles to the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation. Our theme again for the entire year, our theme again for the entire year is, is returning back to the altar. And the idea behind it is that we have left the altar. The altar did not go anywhere. We went. We are the ones who have left. We are the ones that... Jesus has to pursue. It's amazing and it's wonderful to know that we have a God that does pursue us. Now, before getting into the meat of our message, I need to establish some ground rules. Is that all right? You have your Bibles open, whether it be an electronic device or whether it be the actual pen and paper, the actual ink and paper, it's fine by me. I want you to notice Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Please observe the following. First rule, this is moving forward as we go through our seven messages, okay? Number one, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1. who gave John this message? Come on, who did? Jesus did. Now, remember that I have shared with you, you should look for things that are unusual, sister, showers. When you're reading the Bible, look for things that are not common, that they are out of the ordinary. This is out of the ordinary. Why? Because we know, sister, that the Bible says God spoke speaking to Aaron and to Miriam. You remember this? He told them, please note that when I, when a prophet speaks, he shall, I shall give him a dream or a vision, but not so with my servant Moses, whom I speak to him, how? Face to face. Face to face. John is that type of prophet. This is not a message received via the ministry of angels. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. What did I say? Hebrews 1, verse 1. God who in sundry times spoke in times past by what? And everything else. Received these messages from whom? Angels. Not so with John. John receives a personal message from God. This is akin to God telling Moses, bring up two tables of stone and I will write these commandments. So this is different. This is unique. Number two. Number two, go to Revelation chapter 1 verse 20. Revelation, it's not going to be on your screen, but it will be in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. The Bible says, read along with me, this is God speaking, this is Jesus speaking, the mystery of the seven stars are which source in the in So my therefore, right my point is the following. The Bible explains itself. Okay, according to the Bible, according to prophecy, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, no interpretation is of private invention. 
okay? The Bible explains itself. The Bible tells you what these symbols mean. It has the key itself. It doesn't need you to add in your own ideas. Therefore, when we're looking at the Bible, if we want to understand how to interpret prophecy, we ask the Bible and you will find out that the Bible will be happy to tell you how to explain itself. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. What does the Bible say here? What does Jesus say here for us? Blessed, Blessed is he that readeth and, and that, that hear the words of words, this prophecy. And, and what? Keep those things which are written therein. Well, the time Sister is Kirkpatrick, this is for us, not for them. This is for us. God is admonishing us. And why is God admonishing us? Because he knows what's about to come. And since he knows what's about to come, he wants his people to avoid the pitfalls and the harm that are going to come upon those who don't want to hear or refuse to hear. It's not enough that you know. It's not enough that you heard. If we need to put them into practice. And the final thing, final thing, you're going to have to look at this in Leviticus chapter 23, just write it down. Just write it down. Just write it down, Leviticus chapter 23. Now, please work along with me. Remember your imagination. Those of you who know your Bibles, those of you who know Revelation, are you ready? Are you ready? The first group of seven messages are the messages to the who? Church. They are judgment. Because God says, I know. Every single time, yes or no? I know. So he tells you what you're doing right, and he tells you what you have to work on. Can you say amen to that? And then he gives you a warning. What happens if you fail? Or what is your blessing if you succeed, if you hear his advice? So these are judgment motifs. Number two, they are the second group of seven messages found Revelation chapter 5 to about 7. What are they? They are the seven what? Seals. What are seals? A roll, a roll, a scroll, rolled up. Seven seals around them. That is a judgment motif. That in and of itself. Remember that John says in Revelation chapter 5, nobody could open it. No one could. But who was the only one worthy to open it? The Lamb. Praise God. He was the only one worthy of opening. Why? Because he committed no sin. And he's just like us. So he can judge us. Because I didn't say this here. I said this at the last church that I was at. In St. David's or something like that. I forget where I go. Uh, the, the, the motif of judgment is one of which either a king or priest has personal, intimate knowledge. He knows what it's like to be in pain. So he knows what it's like to maybe have a quick temper. Now Jesus didn't have one. And turning over the money changers, that wasn't Jesus angry. That was righteous indignation. That's completely different. You do know the Bible says you can be angry and what? You do know that. Our problem is, is that we forget that and we just go into the right to the sinning. Okay? But Jesus was able to be angry and not sin. Jesus is our judge. So those are seven messages. And those are messages or warnings, judgments upon those who persecute God's people. Number three, what is the next seven series of messages? Trumpets. The trumpets found from about Revelation chapter 7, 8, all the way over to chapter 11. So these three groups of seven comprise what God is warning us about what's going to happen. But there's also a progression, a what? 
follow along with me. And again, if you want to, just send me an email or send me a WhatsApp, and I'll send you the notes. Leviticus 23. What chapter did I say? Leviticus, 23. Leviticus chapter what? 23. 23. That's very important. Who were the ones who were reading Revelation? Were they Jews or Gentiles? Mostly they were what? Jews. So for you and me, this stuff is lost. Okay? We're not seeing important things in Revelation because we're all interested in just pointing fingers at everybody else. So we are missing some things. Is that all right with you? Yeah, you may not have liked that, but it's factual. Let me share with you the following. What was the festival or the feast that you had just before the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur? Anybody know? Leviticus 23. Trumpet. It's the feast of what? Trumpet. Trumpet. So look at this, sister. The Bible says judgment begins in the house of God. Yes or no, Sister Richardson? Okay. First, right? But judgment begins where? So where does judgment begin? In the church. Message to the seven churches. Then it goes out to the world. Yes or no? Yes. The seven seals. Are you following me? Yes or no? And then finally, the judgments. The what? Judgment. Which are the seven plagues. But before the seven plagues, what seven messages do you have? Trumpets. Trumpets. Notice how even Revelation follows the pathway of Leviticus chapter 23. By the way, which is the last festival in Leviticus chapter 23? Anybody know? The Feast of Booths. Feast of Booths. Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. And what does Revelation 21 and 22 end with? Are you seeing this? Yes or no? Notice how Revelation follows the very same progression that we have in the Old Testament in the festivals of the Jewish nation. Now, why is this incumbent upon us to know? It is incumbent upon us to know this stuff so that way we know what God is doing. Please observe that, in Ephes that, the, that the message of Revelation is one of the message to the Ephesian church is you've lost your love. In some way, you have lost that quality that makes you indistinguishable from me. Because God is what? Love. And you have lost that. You have everything else. Notice, let's read it together. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I'll read in your hearing. You follow along with me. It'll be in your Bible. It won't be on the screen. To the church of Ephesus write, these things write, that he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And you already met him in chapter 1. I know your works and your labor and your patience and you cannot bear them which are evil and you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not and you found them to be liars. You have borne, you have, and you have, you have borne and you have patience for my name's sake and you have labored and you haven't fainted. Yet one thing do I have. You have left your first love. Remember from when you have fallen and repent, do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove your candlestick from its place except you repent. But this one thing you have, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I what? Also hate. Also uh, what? Yeah. Uh, surprise. What the things you find when you read your Bible. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, if God says to him who overcomes, that means you can turn this around. Amen. You have everything else. You know the doctrine. Praise God. You know what the Bible says. Praise God. But the question isn't that. The question is, do you have love? Because when you look at the altar, how can you not see love? I like to imagine 
that the very first sacrifice, now it's not in the Bible, it's in my head, so you do with it whatever you want. But when Adam had to bring a lamb, I think of it as the first lamb. You know, the first one that God created? The one that God said, just be a lamb, and there was a lamb. I, I, I think of it that way because I'm thinking that maybe Adam, he had an affinity towards that lamb. He was the first, that was the first lamb. And somehow they got acquainted and somehow they became friends. Now, pastor, you're, you're, you're going too far. Am I? Am I? Because in the Exodus, in what book? In Exodus, God says that the children of Israel are to set a lamb aside to offer it as a sacrifice. That didn't mean that you went to the barn and you put a goat to the side or a sheep to the side. No, you brought it home with you. Anybody know what happens to a lamb when you take care of it in your house? Becomes your dog. Um, excuse me, I know some of you are cat people. I don't understand you, okay? I only understand dog people. I cannot understand cat people, but I know you exist. Don't worry, I'm not judging you. I just don't know how you're going to make it to heaven. But anyway, moving on. The Bible said that the lamb that the children of Israel were supposed to sacrifice, so for the very first Passover, was to be a pet for them. How much pleasure do you think you're going to have when you have to sacrifice that lamb? The Bible says that Adam brought that lamb. The Bible says that Adam was the one who had to have sacrificed that lamb because it wasn't the priest. It was the penitent who was supposed to sacrifice the lamb. It was the sinner who slew the lamb. He would grab his neck, pull it up, go across his neck, and bring the knife across. Not a stab, but cutting of the jugular. That's how he did it. And then after that, he made the tea in session. He went from across to diagonal. And then he would lay it on the altar. Whenever you would look at an altar, you would then remember that that's what's going to happen to Jesus. And he's going to die because he loves us. He loves us so much. I mean, do you, th 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 here is, Jesus, help me, I'm getting off the subject. Here is, here is, here is, here is um, an idea. I want you to think about this, okay? If heaven is perfect, why does God need us? We don't currently live in heaven. We live on the earth. Can we agree on that, yes or no? But in John chapter 14, what does Jesus say? I go to what? Place for you. A price for you. Place. That means for Jesus. That means for God. That means for the Father. That means for the Holy Spirit. That means that heaven is not perfect without us. Not complete. And those of you who live far apart from your family, you understand that there's only so much comfort that Zoom can afford you. Those of you who live far from your family understand that there's only so much joy you can get out of FaceTime. There's nothing like we are going to be together. And that's the same thing that we see in Revelation. And we see this in the love of God. And God says to the church of Ephesus, you have one problem. You forgot your first love. I need seven volunteers. Who wants to be a volunteer? Raise your hand. Number one, find me Revelation chapter 2. Find me Revelation chapter 2. Find me Revelation chapter 2 verse 1. I want you to see the impetus of God. I need another volunteer. Find me Revelation chapter 2, 5. Who wants to do 2, 5? Let me see your hand. 2, 5. Okay. Okay. No, 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 no. I don't want the microphone going around. I want people who are watching online to have to do this on their own. 
I want, need a third volunteer. I need somebody to find for me 216. Who has 216? Anybody? There you go, 216. I need somebody else, 225. Who wants to do 225? Sister Bernice, 225. Don't worry, you who raised your hand over here on the side. You want to do Revelation chapter 3, verse 3? Go ahead, Sister uh, Geneva. Sister Geneva. I need two more volunteers. I need John, Revelation 311. 311 over here. Eileen, and I need one more volunteer, 320. Okay, Sister, Sister Brown, 320. All right, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Read it for me, please. Stand in a booming voice. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things say that he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. What is he doing? He's walking. What is he doing? Walking. Let's go on to the next one. Revelation chapter 2, 5. It's on the screen. Go ahead. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent. Do the first verse. For else I will come unto you quickly and will remove your candlestick out of the state. Accept you repent. I will what? Come. Come. Notice there is movement. Notice the message to the seven churches is time is running out. Go the next one. 216. Read that for me, please. Whoever has 216, stand up and read booming voice. Sister Sister Richardson. I will what? I will what? Come. 225. Who has it? Till I what? Come. Hold it until I come, or else, otherwise, in the Greek, arrive. Moving on. 3-3, three, three. somebody who has that? I will what? I will come. 311. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. I come what? Quickly or soon. I come what? Quickly. Quickly. It's almost time. Last one. 321. 320. Do you get it? Jesus is coming. The message of Revelation over and over again is Jesus is coming. Each one of these messages, the seven lampstands, the seven seals, the seven trumpets or shofar, they have the same message. Jesus is coming. You are worth coming back for. You are worth it. Not only were you worth my sacrifice, you are worth me coming back for. That's love. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that you can get there. And then on top of that, I'm going to send people or send somebody, send someone, send something to get you and to come back. And then because all of that is going to fail, I'll do it myself. This is why Matthew chapter 28, the message is what? Go ye therefore. Because they are important to me. So you get them. According to Dr. Dukan, Dr. Dukan, the vision of the seven seals runs parallel to that of the seven letters. They recount the same story, but with a different emphasis. While the seven letters denounce the heresies of the churches, the seven seals condemn their oppression, violence, and persecution. 
Was the church persecuted or was it not? Yes or no? Yes. Continuing on about the seven trumpets, the last one, the last of the seven. The shofar's answer to the seals at vengeance answers oppression. Because the nations did not heed the warnings of the seals, then the shofars announced and pronounced their judgment. The seals revealed to us oppression, and now the shofar pro proclaims judgment. For example, Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, the seals. And I saw, and behold, a what? And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth to conquer, conquering and to conquer. In other words, in the Greek, it says he was conquering so that he could conquer even more. And this was a militant church. Militant because they knew they had a short time. First, Jesus said, go to Jerusalem, but do not go to Samaria. Why? Because there is a 70-week prophecy, Daniel chapter 9. Can you follow along with me? Yes or no? Notice and observe that even Jesus knew the prophecies that he himself gave. So they were following it. They knew that from the death of the Messiah, Jesus, they only had how many more years left? Three and a half. And exactly on the stoning of Stephen, you see that the gospel opens up wide to the Gentiles. So if you are not a Jew, you should thank God that the message came to you. The church understood that. That's why they were so anxious to make sure that every person under heaven would hear the message. But it wasn't easy. It was a time of difficulty because there was a competing church. Hey, what? Did you hear what I said? What did I say? And this shouldn't be a surprise to you because you've seen this all along. This happened in heaven. How many of the angels fell from heaven? A third. Notice. By the way, what happened in the Garden of Eden? 100% apostasy. I mean, not, not, not a 50%. This was 100% apostasy. Both Adam and Eve, yes or no? Yes. And then who comes walking? Because you're worth it. Because you're worth it. Because you're worth it. You're worth it. Everything is lost. I'll just start again. No. I'm willing to go down, and I'll get them myself. That's why. Let's skip. Let's skip to the race, okay? Did Jerusalem divide into the northern tribes and the southern tribes after the death of Solomon? Yes or no? Yes. Did the northern tribes then go prisoner to Assyria? Yes or no? What was the only tribe that was left? Jerusalem. Judah, two and a half. That's it. Then after that, what happens? What happens to those fools? They go to Babylon. Yes or no? Yes. And then what comes out of Babylon? A remnant. Everybody say it with me. A what? A remnant. Remnant. That's what God always works with. You don't think so? Read Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. He even says there's going to be a remnant. Read Revelation chapter 12, 17. There's a remnant. Let's move on. That remnant continues on until the time of Jesus, yes or no? Yes. And then who is the new remnant? The disciples, the apostles, the ones who follow the way. And then that one apostatizes, and it becomes the Catholic Church. Am I lying or am I telling you the truth? Is this history, yes or no? Yes. And then what comes out of them? The Protestant Reformation. Yes or no? Yes. And then from the Protestant Reformation, we're going to skip a bunch of years, and we're just going to say, Revelation chapter 12, 17, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And then even that one, because Revelation 14, 12 no longer talks about it as a group. It speaks about it as individuals. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Jesus. 
there's always a remnant. And why is there needed to be a remnant? Because of persecution. Because of what? Persecution. persecution. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. I know it uh, says something else on the screen. Don't pay attention to that. Pay attention to 8, verse 7 in your Bibles. Go to Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. Notice what happens to the church because it persecuted God's people. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. Revelation chapter 8, verse what? 7. Let's read along this. I need two volunteers. I need two volunteers. I need one volunteer to find me Isaiah chapter 40, verse 7 and 8. Who wants to do that? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 7 and 8. Don't everybody raise your hand at the same time. All right? I see your hand, sister, there. I need somebody else to find me Psalms. Psalms chapter 1. Uh, I trusted my memory. I should have known better. Psalms chapter 1, verse 3. Somebody, well, there you go. Psalms chapter 1, verse 3. Let's read this. Revelation 8, 7. Don't pay, don't pay attention to the one on the screen. It's Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. Let's read it together. The first angel sounded, and there followed what? Fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the? And the third part were burnt up, and all... Now, we understand that this is a judgment, yes or no? When you look throughout the Bible, you see that God has judgments, and they are with hail, fire, and blood, okay? These are, these are typical in Revelation. But our question is, what is this about the earth? What is this about the third part of the trees? And what is this about the grass? Good question. Let's see what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 40. Sister, would you please read 7 and 8? The grass withereth, the flower fades, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Hmm, interesting. Notice how the Bible uses trees and the grass as analogous to God's people. Did I make this up, or is this what the Bible says? Number two, what about the trees? Please, Orlin, read that for me. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Who persecuted the church of Christ? It wasn't the Romans. It was the Jewish nation, yes or no? This was a judgment against them. Was this judgment fulfilled, yes or no? What happened in the year 70 AD? And here you go. Pastor, that's kind of loose. No, it's not. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The Bible says it's its own interpreter. And if you want to, just go ahead and read Revelation chapter 7. Read Revelation chapter 7. The Bible says, And I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on any sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Now notice what he says in verse 3. Can you read it with me? Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have what? Sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. It is a metaphor. It is a metaphor. According to C. Mervyn Maxwell. C. Mervyn Maxwell. I'm going, I went old school. The first trumpet symbolizes divine judgment that came upon Jerusalem and the Jewish nation when it set itself against Christ and his followers. And again, from Dr. Gain in his book, Trumpet After Trumpet, the first trumpet sounded after the close of probation for Israel as a what? As a nation. So what is the message to the church of Ephesus? You saw what happened to them. When I say I'm going to do something, it happens. Remember from where you have fallen. You lost your first love. There was a period in time when what you did, you did it with joy. 
There was a period of time in what you did, you did it with, with fervor, with passion. You did it because it came out of love. It came out of a desire to do it. Why? Because you are serving me. You are serving me. But now what you do, you just do out of route. You just do because you have to do it. You just do because there's nothing else to do. I mean, notice before COVID. Before COVID, everybody just came to church. Spent two and a half years having Zoom on TV, and now what? Ah, just stay home. Oh, no, no, Pastor, you can't say that. Why can't I? You still spend money to go over and watch a cup match, but you could have watched it on TV, right? But you had to go. I mean, am I, am I lying or am I not? I mean, please tell me, because if I'm, if I'm out of line, then I'm out of line. I mean, you're demonstrating what's important to you. You could watch games on TV, but you still hold on to those season passes, and you have to fly from here to the United States to watch that game. But you're still holding on to it. The church of Ephesus had fallen away. The church of Ephesus was at first a church that was interested in maintaining doctrinal purity. You can just read about it in, in scripture, in the Bible. Galatians chapter 1 verse 9. As we said before, I say again now, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that you have not received, let him be what? A curse. A curse. That means let him go to hell. Just in case you didn't know in the actual Greek. How about for doctrines? How about for doctrines? Well, let's look. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? God. Who do you think that was against? It was against everybody. Because neither the Romans nor the Jews could accept that Jesus Christ is God. Even today. Still got the same nonsense. And how about leadership? Oh, my God, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 11 stipulates clearly about elders and deacons' roles. Stipulates clearly what they are allowed and not allowed to do. And please note that it gets into your business because Paul, inspired by God, yes or no? Yes. Says, even though in society you may be seen as somebody important because you have more than one wife. If you got more than one wife, you got a lot of time and you got a lot of money. Yes or no? Yeah, nobody else get it. No, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. He ain't looking for that. But you can't be a leader in the church. So you think that your personal life cannot influence whether or not you can be a leader at the church? It does. You don't think so because you don't read your Bibles. And what about, and what about, oh my God, false brethren? Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. 16, 17 and 18. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and what? Avoid, Avoid them. them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good works and fair speeches, what? Deceive, Deceive the, hearts. the hearts of who? The simple. The simple. I mean, amazing the stuff that you find when you actually read your Bibles. And what about community service? What about helping people? What about that? Let's see what the Bible says. Let's see what the Bible says. First of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 9. Let not a widow be taken into the number under 60 years old, having been the wife of one man. Why? Because it was the church's responsibility to help the widows. But guess what? There was a guideline. I don't believe that. The Bible did that? Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And come on, you all should remember this one, right? He who doesn't work, shouldn't eat. 
the stuff that you find when you study your Bible. I mean, and then you wonder, well, why does the church do this? My question is, how do you not know? And what about the culture? And what about the culture? Ephesus was the golden jewel in the Roman province. Ephesus had the largest temple. It is believed it is one of the seven wonders of the world. Ephesus had a, a library that was the envy of all of the world. And the temple of Artemis, the temple of Diana, was not only a temple for worship, it was also a bank and an asylum. Slaves could run to the temple of Artemis, and they could not be drawn out. They were allowed to live there, but they could never leave, but they had to live there. And finally, it was the place of debauchery. And people think that today is different. It's not. The temple worship of Artemis was one in which children were used as slaves. Now, those of you with children, you might want to take them out now. Those of you with children might want to take them out now. This is from the World Health Organization. Go Google it. You'll find it. You'll read it. You'll see it yourself. What do they believe? They believe that children as young as five years old can start receiving children sexuality education. And by the way, our school curriculums, public school curriculums, are following, anybody guess? Yes, the World Health Economic, the World Health Organization. Now, a few years ago, last year, I've been doing it every single Sabbath, every single year that I've been the pastor of this church. And it's not because I hate anybody. It is because I know how detrimental this stuff is to children because I suffered it. I already told you guys about that. We're not going to get into that again. I warned you that this allowance of this pride parade is not going to decrease. It's going to increase. And now you have an entire almost week of pride festivities going on. And please observe that they are calling Wednesday the Harbor Night Takeover. And their goal is not adults, but their goal and objective is to influence your children. Mine are grown. I have worry enough about my two other grandchildren, one of them living in California. I have enough. But these children, I consider mine as well, as long as I am your pastor. It may not happen after, 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 after this gets out. Not from the conference, not from the conference. Don't anybody think from the conference. Because this cannot continue unless money is being made. Are you hearing me? As long as money is being made, as long as there is a hotel in St. George's that needs to be filled, and there are restaurants that need to be filled, and there are tax, taxi drivers that need to drive taxis, and there's everything else that needs it, as long as they are making money, this stuff is going to continue. But the moment that money stops being made from this, it stops. Need the video, need audio. Let's do this again. And if you think I'm alone, we're almost finished, folks. Ready? Get the lights. There is no pride in indoctrinating children in schools. There is no pride in stripping parents of their right to protect their children. There is no pride in sexualizing children at drag shows.
There is no pride in mutilating and sterilizing children in the name of gender-affirming care. This June, what are you proud of? Because we have some issues that we need to talk about. We're fighting back from inside the community. Join Gays Against Groomers in the battle against radical gender ideology that is destroying our youth. Believe it or not, the LGBT whatever community is not as united as they want to pretend. And this organization has been brought down and their PayPal's have been closed, their source of finances have been closed, banks have closed access to them. Just so that way you know. Okay. This is gonna get worse. I warned you about covering up your children's eyes. This is now what's happening in the United States. When this starts happening in Bermuda, because you have allowed it to happen, you will remember me. This does not end at the parade. The idea, the intent is to go all the way with it. And you are way too small and too tiny to handle this. According to the spirit of prophecy, it was Satan's studied effort to pervert the marriage institution, to weaken its obligations, lessen its sacredness, for in no surer way could he deface the image of God in man and open the door for misery and vice. Pastor, why are you doing this? Because this is part of the message for the church of Laodicea. Please observe. Revelation chapter 2, please observe, it's in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 2, notice what Jesus says. And I told you, if there's something unusual in the Bible, you should pay attention. Nevertheless, he says, he says, but this you have, verse 6, that you hate the deeds of the who? Nicolaitans. The Galatians. What was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? It's real simple. Just look at history. According to history, the Nicolaitans were the heretical followers of Nicholas of Antioch, one of the seven deacons of the early church who ended up in heresy. The presence of the church threatened to destroy the integrity and purity of the Christian faith and conduct. The Nicolaitans are compared with the sins of Balaam, Revelation chapter 2, 14 and 15, teaching what? Sexual immorality and what? Deviance. This, God talks about. Because in the Ephesus, their number one export, in Ephesus, the number one thing that they did was sexual immorality. So what is God's answer? It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Go there, please. Now, you know this. As we wrap up, you know this. As we wrap up, you know this. Follow along with me. I just want you to observe what happens when you work from the premise of love. When you teach people out of love and not out of being right. When you approach people out of a desire that they burn not in hell, that you want them to be with you for all eternity. That you are willing to forgive people who put you on the altar that you're willing to pray for people that despise you. You're willing to pray for people that treat you rudely, that treat you wrong. This is what happens. You know it very well. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall in, not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, idolaters, effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit what? The kingdom of God. Now please notice this. This is very important. Verse 11. Read it. And such were some of you. Stop. What was it about the church of Corinth that homosexuals found it safe to come into that church and be transformed? You're not listening. Please listen. What was it about the church of Corinth that made drunkards feel safe 
to come into that church and be transformed? What was it that made thieves, adulterers, drug addicts, people filled with tattoos and piercings all over their bodies and all over their faces? What was it about that church? Do you want to know what it was? It was love. It was love. Because they knew that they were coming into a group of church, a group of people that said, you know what? God is still working on me. I'm sure he's working on you too. I'm going to give you time to change. I'm going to give you time to become what God wanted you to be. Because I'm still trying to become what God wants me to be. Is anybody still trying to become what God wanted them to be? Yeah. Is anybody still working on their character? Is anybody still praying to God, please change me? then that's the church that these people came to. A church where a mother with five kids could come to and nobody ask them, well, who's their daddy? A church where a kid could show up and nobody ask them, well, where have you been? We haven't seen you. A church where people can come, and yes, everybody knows what's on the newspaper and what they did and what they didn't do, but they're fine. Can you imagine that a family that just suffered the loss of a child, whether self-inflicted or otherwise, can feel and know that they are safe coming to that church because ain't nobody going to ask them questions that they don't need answers to. I can tell you, in closing, that that's how I became a Seventh-day Adventist. That's how I became one. Because I went to a church that they kind of knew pretty much a lot of what I had done. And I didn't really try to hide it anyway. And they just loved me. It wasn't a Sabbath that I wasn't invited to eat at their house. There wasn't a Sabbath or a Tuesday night prayer meeting that they didn't genuinely act as if they were happy to see me. Now, I don't know if they were really happy to see me because, I mean, sometimes I'm not even happy to see myself in the mirror. You know what I'm saying? But they, they acted happy. That church won me. The pastor pissed me off, but that church won me. I studied my Bible just to prove him wrong, and I kept proving him right. Go figure. I'm from New York. I believe Warwick could be that church. We haven't had one baptism all year. Did you hear what I said? Not one. Not one person has asked, praise team, please come on up. Not one person has asked. Not one person. What is it? Do they not feel the love? I'm asking you, Warwick, what is it? Do they not feel the love? Because I do know this, when somebody feels love, they come, and they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they serve because they feel love. The message to the church of Ephesus, which was trying to keep doctrinal purity, make sure that everything was right, Make sure that people believed and did what everybody, what the Bible said that they were supposed to do. The number one mistake that Church of Ephesus had was they had no love. If you need to regain that love, as the praise team sings, come on up. I know it's late, but you spent a whole lot of time watching that cup match, and you didn't complain. Who needs to ask God to renew their love? Come forward. Let's have a word of prayer. Anybody else? Come forward. Just have a prayer that God renews their love.
Anybody else? Come forward. Ask God to renew that love. Anybody else? I'm going to have one more call, one more time, one more time. You're not coming forward for baptism. You're coming to renew that love, that passion, that desire, that joy that you used to have in serving him. You're coming forward for that. Anybody else? Go ahead, pray, Steve. Doctrinal purity is not enough. Anybody else? your heads please for a word of prayer every eye closed please give somebody the opportunity just to respond to my altar call those of you watching online I ask you to do the same thing take this time right now to tell God what it is that has caused you to lose your love is it the lack of recognition was it that your plans and ideas were not accepted and not applauded? Was it that you felt no support? Trust me, tell Jesus. He looked for his friends and they were nowhere around him. Trust me, look at God who keeps giving blessings and all he receives is why didn't you do this or that or the other. He understands. Now just tell him how you feel and now ask him ask him to forgive you why because you should be serving him not man what you do you do for God you don't do for yourself you're doing it to serve God let God be God serve him and ask God to renew a right spirit in you Ask God to remind you of that love that you have for him. Ask God. Father God, we are not looking at other churches. We're not looking at what other people are doing or not doing. We recognize that these messages are for us, for us, for your church. And Father, we are asking you to give us that love again. Help us, Father, to do the works that we used to do. And help us, Father, to do it out of love. In Jesus' precious name, amen. If anybody would like to speak with me, I will be in the office. Today I will be walking around Parliament seven times at four o'clock because if if Joshua can make the walls of Jericho fall down who knows maybe some politicians mind will be changed and maybe just maybe this parade will not take place at four o'clock I'm walking around Parliament seven times God bless you all if you need to talk to me I'll be there God bless you
please stand for our closing hymn, Standing on the Promises of God. Father, teach us to love, dear Lord. Teach us to hate the sin, but love the sinner, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we're remembered, we're reminded when Peter denied you three times, dear Lord. Because many of us have denied you in our walks through our life. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And Peter and, and Jesus says, feed my lambs. Dear Lord, let us remember to be a witness for you in love that this church may be open to sinners like ourselves. They may feel comfortable and they may come to you and that we may be all saved in that kingdom. For Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated unto us.
thank you so much for tuning in to the Warwick Seventh-day Adventist Church broadcast. We're so glad that you keep on coming back. Go ahead, send us a message. Subscribe us on YouTube and send us a message on Facebook. Actually, if you have a prayer request or even a question, send that there at Facebook too. We're just so glad that you're tuning in and we're thankful for all that you are doing. Now, if you've missed something, why don't you check us out on our website at warwick.adventistchurch.org. This has been the Warwick Seventh-day Adventist Church broadcast where we worship God. <laughs>